Oppo has announced the N1 running Color OS on top of Android 4.2. There's a Cyanogen tie up too, and Clever Money now has it that the latter's stock Android experience will be an option you can choose when you buy. The N1 itself is a very large 5.9 inch IPS 1080p display with physical Android control keys and available in black and white. Other options include 16 or 32 gig of flash memory, but sadly there's no micro SD card slot. It's all powered by 1.7 GHz Snapdragon 600 with 2 gig of RAM. The major unique selling point here is a 13 megapixel camera mounted on a swiveling module, rotating by 206 degrees, allowing it to act as a front facing camera as well. The camera specs are otherwise unremarkable, think Galaxy S4, etc. Also interesting is the O-Touch area on the back, accepting gestures to control certain applications. The whole shooting match is sustained by a 3610 mAh battery. Yola has released more details of its first generation smartphone running Sailfish OS. It'll have a 4.5 inch quote Estrade display, whatever the heck that is, with QHD resolution, a 1.4 gig dual core processor and 1 gig of RAM. If that sounds unremarkable, bear in mind that Sailfish OS is likely to be a lot more efficient on hardware resources than Android. There's also an 8 megapixel camera with 16 gig of internal storage plus micro SD. The battery will be user replaceable, hooray, and will be rated at 2100 milliamps powers. Selfish OS will also be optimised to support Android 4 applications and Yola looks to get this out before the end of 2013. The beleaguered BlackBerry has announced the Z30, the largest ever smartphone it's shipped, coming with OS 10.2, which hasn't yet reached my Q10. The Z30 is built around a 5-inch Super AMOLED 720p display with a dual-core 1.7 GHz Snapdragon S4 Pro and 2 GB of RAM. Now, the thing you all know I love more than anything else in the world, a back cover which comes off to reveal a sealed flipping battery. It's 2800 milliamp hours, but come on, what's the point in all that peelable plastic just for inserting your SIM card? Worryingly, BlackBerry knows that battery life isn't going to be great on the Z30, so it's including a full portable USB charger in every box. Facepalm doesn't begin to cover it. I hated the Sony Xperia Z, you know. You can probably tell reading between the lines of my video review and phone show 195. Well, I've got news for you. I don't hate its successor as much. The Xperia Z1 is a big improvement on most fronts. Original Z owners will be galled to see this appear just six months later, but for the rest of us, the presence of the Z1 is a big win. Look, it's still an over tall slab, but there's now an aluminium frame to add both class and also some nice rounded edges at the bottom. These don't dig into the palms quite as much as they did on the Z. It's much more comfortable to hold. There are still huge bezels here, top and bottom, not helped by the use of on-screen virtual Android controls, meaning that in almost all applications, content only actually starts about an inch above the bottom of the phone. There are now less of the tiresome waterproof flaps. The headphone socket is now proofed on the inside and of the remaining three for micro USB and charging, micro SD and micro SIM here, they all have to be kept behind flaps still, the first for charging and safety reasons, and the latter two, well, just to look neater really. <laughs> on the left side are also two metal contacts here. These are for a magnetic charging dock that sits on your desk and saves you having to open the micro USB charging port cover at all, which should help avoid hassle and reduce wear and tear and therefore make the waterproofing more reliable. The silly oversized power button is now a lot more discreet and the Z's disappointing camera has been significantly beefed up with the Z1 here with a larger sensor, of which more later. You may remember the insane speaker positioning on the Z on the bottom right side where it will be muffled every time the phone was held. DAX fixed too. The speaker now outputs sound through a small opening in the bottom face and it's not bad either. Here's a demo. Well, it's not terrifically loud, but it's not terrifically tenny either. A special prize if you can name which album this came from. It's not the one you think. <laughs> Audio quality via wired or Bluetooth headphones is fantastic on the Z1. Sony is really switched on here. There are the Aptex codex covered by the A2DP profile on Bluetooth. And yes, it's OK if you didn't understand that last sentence. Still curious here is the use of factory fitted front and back plastic screen protectors. I just don't get these. Surely they're, they're more scratchable than the Gorilla Glass underneath. They just add a somewhat, well, clammy feel to what should be cold glass. And they also attract fingerprints and dust far more. You cannot 
keep the Xperia Z1 in a pocket or put it down on a household surface or it'll come away looking like this every single time. Sony, don't bother with the protectors next time, eh? By the way, if you're very careful with a razor blade, very careful, it's possible to just leave them up and remove them, but this was a review unit, so I didn't dare try. The screen on the Z was one of the most disappointing features, and it's better here on the Z1. You don't have to view it absolutely head on, and the blacks are, well, they're a bit closer to black. We've been spoiled a bit by the super displays on Samsung's top galaxies, Nokia's CBD affairs on the Lumia's, and HTC and iPhone and Oh heck, everything north of £300 SIM free, which is why it's still a little disappointing that Sony's using display tech, well, effectively from about 2009. There's X Reality for mobile, a way of boosting colours and contrast in software for when viewing photos or videos, but heck, this shouldn't be needed at all, really. Sony just put a better screen in. It's 1080p and very crisp, but I'd rather have blacker blacks, and I suspect I'm not alone. <laughs> Once things get going, the Z1 shines though. It's Sony's Xperia UI and a known quantity, with the slight tweak here in the slide out Android 4.3 style panel of options in the app launcher. Don't be too fooled though, since it's just Android 4.2 under the hood. No doubt Sony will issue an update to 4.3, quote, as soon as possible. So that's, well, Christmas, if you're lucky. The UI and general operations are admirably fast, helped by a genuinely cutting-edge Snapdragon 800 processor inside, running at 2.2 gigahertz, along with 2 gig of RAM. Wow, that's uh, basically my desktop spec from a couple of years ago. <laughs> Battery life is good too. The Z1 easily made it through the day, as you'd expect from a 3000 milliamp hour battery. Over and above the usual Android application set, there's Sony's own set of media shops with Sony Select, Video Unlimited, Music Unlimited, PlayStation Mobile, and so on, plus promo apps like Xperia Lounge and Xperia Privilege. It's a slightly bewildering set of extras in that there's so much duplication with Google's own Play Store offerings. Sony is obviously hoping that new users start off in their own siloed content stores and never leave, but I wish the company would stick to just making the hardware. There's also the viewer-only part of Office Suite, somewhat redundant now that the full quick Office Suite has been released as freeware by Google. Go grab it now, plus the usual track ID, and Track ID TV, the rather pointless McAfee security and the trivial photo effects utility Pixlr Express. Smart Connect here has been seen before in Sony devices and attempts to action the appropriate system functions and apps when certain events occur, for example, plugging in headphones or your charger. It's a nice idea and certainly worth exploring. Plenty for new users to explore overall, really, and plenty for Android old hands like me to have to delete or sidestep equally. So why should anyone plump for the Z1? Certainly not for the form factor, it's more cumbersome than the HTC One and the Galaxy S4, but the Z1 is faster and there's the potential clincher in the camera. With a 1 over 2.3 inch optical format sensor and f2.0 aperture, the Z1's camera already looks like leading the Android pack, the bulbous Galaxy S4 zoom aside. There's a 20 megapixel sensor here uh, and a dedicated BIONS image processor outputting an oversampled 8 megapixels in pretty much the same way as the Nokia's 808 and Lumia 1020 pure view devices do. Plus you can zoom in by almost two times without losing any genuine pixel detail. In theory then, the Z1 is walking in Nokia's pure view shoes and in good light it does exactly that, putting out rather splendid shots with small amounts of tasteful zoom here and there. However, the sensor is inherently far noisier than it should be, and even copious amounts of noise reduction can't really stop low light and flash lit shots turning into noisy, blurry messes. Plus, how could Sony have decided on a camera champion Android flagship like this and forgotten to put in a proper zin and flash? As it is, you rock up to a party with the cutting edge Z1, you take shots like this, while your Nokia Lumia 1020 owning friend may lack a native Instagram client, but he gets this shot. They're worlds apart, and now that flat capacitors are available for driving Xenon bulbs, as in the 1020, Sony really hasn't got any excuse for missing out such a flash here. Video capture is excellent, though don't put too much store in the claimed Nokia-like pure view zoom, as you'll see. Now the pure view-like uh, lossless zoom system isn't as great, on the Nokia devices but there's still a fair amount you can do and in good light here the picture's not too noisy. Zooming out again. So pretty impressive really to have this without any bulky 
um, fragile mechanical optics. I think this is the way to go. Computational photography in most of our upcoming smartphones. So this is with the steady shot stabilization turned on. All digital of course, there's no hardware OIS. And this is with the steady shot stabilization system turned off. And back on again. So there we are, test footage, pretty good quality. Pretty excellent in fact on the Sony Xperia Z1. There's no doubt that the Xperia Z1 is the device the Z should have been. The only trouble is that the Z2, no doubt to be launched at MWC 2014, will be the device that the Z1 should have been. Sony is iterating fast and may well get there with its Xperia line, but the Z1, despite a host of improvements and things to admire, isn't quite the Android champion it desperately wants to be.